You can hear me, right? Okay, welcome. Thank you for coming to the Conflict and Tension panel. Um, I'll start it off by introducing our guests. They can each tell you a little bit about themselves. To my far right is Anthony Badalka. We have Rhiannon Held here and Barb Geiger. And I'm Susan McGregor. So we'll start with you, Anthony, if you want to just tell us a little bit about... Well, we should all know who you are, but tell us anyway. (laughs) All right. My name is uh, Anthony Badulka, and I write the Russell Quant mystery series. And for those of you who haven't read all the bios, the way I like to describe my character is that I claim that he is the first and only half Ukrainian, half Irish, ex cop, ex farm boy, gay, world traveling, wine swilling, uh, wise cracking Canadian private eye being written about today by anyone anywhere. <laughs> There are eight books in the series. The eighth just came out this spring. And beginning spring 2013, I'm starting a brand new mystery series featuring a character by the name of Adam Saint. And Adam Saint is a Canadian disaster recovery agent. So wherever there's a disaster anywhere in the world, be it man-made or natural, so think you know, typhoon, plane crash, civil war, the CDRA would send in an agent like Adam Saint. That's me. Um, well, I am the author of Silver, which is the first in an urban fantasy series from Tor. Um, the next one, Tarnished, is going to be out next year. I don't have the exact date yet. Um, and I, in my day job, am also a professional archaeologist. So this, this is werewolves, but with an archaeological sort of twist, because I sat down and thought about um, what their culture is, what their religion is, um, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, how they would work as a species, because they're a species rather than some kind of magical curse. So, um, yeah. Cool. My name is Barb Geiger. I write. Um, my pen name is Angela Fiddler, and I write mainly gay erotica. And uh, I have seven or eight books out, and hopefully none of you have read any of them. <laughs> Why hopefully? Because I don't want to know anybody who's read my books. Oh. <laughs> I don't. Okay. All right. Oh, there's tension already. <laughs> yeah. Like, why? Well, okay, anyway. I'm Susan McGregor. I'm a fiction editor with On Spec Magazine. Last year, I co edited Tesseract 15 with Julie Trinada, which was a great, great experience. Um, I currently have a novel sitting at about a different 11 publishers in New York. Hopefully, somebody will pick it up, so we'll. Got fingers and toes and eyes crossed for that. Anyway, let's get started. Um, I'm going to open the discussion up with basically asking each one of uh, my panelists uh, here to comment on their basic techniques for uh, creating tension and conflict, if there's a difference between the two, how they start in particular uh, with their openings. So just sort of an overview and then maybe to look at at, uh, openings of their, their novels, their stories. So, Anthony, maybe we can begin with you. Sure. I think when I, when I first think about conflict and tension, I mean, when you think about what the definition is, conflict is, you know, when things are coming into collision and there's disagreement, there's opposition. Tension, I think of more of as sort of the feeling. It's, uh, you know, mental, emotional strain, uh, anxiety, uh, all those good things, especially when you write a murder mystery like I do. When I am beginning to write my books, I don't sort of look at it as, you know, some people think, you know, there's got to be some great tension or conflict on every page. I don't, it, it, I don't know if there's a right answer. That's not my process. I tend to look at things from a much bigger uh, portion of the book. So it's more like by chapter. Like, does that chapter introduce conflict and tension? And is it drawing the reader along? I think as far as creating conflict and tension, so, you know, they are different things, but they are so, uh, you know, there's so much interweaving between the two of them. For me, I've got, I think, probably two or three main ways that I would do it. First of all is by character. And you can have, a, you know, quite a wide range of types of characters in any, in any books. With mine, I have my main character, Russell Quant, And there's maybe six or seven subsidiary characters that return in each book uh, to varying degrees. Out of those subsidiary characters, I would say that maybe 
you know, four or five of them are there to support my main c- character in different ways, be it emotionally or professionally. But I can think of maybe two who are there intentionally to create some conflict in a very low degree. They don't hate him. They don't want to kill him. But they don't see the world in the same way. So when you've got a returning character like I do, you know, you really are trying to find a character who your readership is going to relate to and like. Having other characters who maybe don't like him very much or disagree with him or see the world in a different way immediately creates some tension. And, you know, I know even as I'm writing sections with Russell Quant and he's got a woman named Errol who's in his life, she never sees things the same way he does. And those scenes tend to really sparkle because there is always that underlying conflict. Now, of course, in Mysteries you have that built-in go-to for conflicting characters. You've got the bad guy. And whether it's a thief or an adulterer or a murderer, that's sort of your high level of character conflict. I think the other level of uh, conflict and tension is by situation. And again, in Murder Mysteries, you've got that go-to. You've Mm -hmm. got that crime that happens you know, usually very early in the book and immediately starts creating that that conflict and that tension. But it's not a given. You really have to think hard about how you're introducing that. You have to either involve your characters or involve your reader somehow so that they're feeling that tension to just sort of, you know, open your chapter and say, you know, XYZ, who you don't know who they are, is, you know, found bludgeoned to death There's nothing really tense about that. There's no conflict yet. You have to either have introduced that character who is eventually going to be found dead or have some relationship with your main character. Otherwise, you've got a bit of a dead fish. Um, I think situations you can think about, you know, hot-button situations, uh, be it political, like introduce a situation that's, you know, contentious, be it, you know, abortion or euthanasia. Um, You can have situations that uh, are, you know, emotional. So funerals, weddings are always really good for for conflict. Anything that involves families, there's, you know, know, so many things that that involve tension. Um, Cultural things, uh, putting your, your main character in places in the world that they aren't used to. That's very useful for creating tension and and culture because they're, you know, they're, you're used to seeing your, your reader is used to seeing them in a certain situation, in a certain type of cultural environment. If you put them somewhere else, it starts adding uh, different layers of, of tension. So in my books and every one of the Russell Quant mysteries, he always begins and ends in his home city, which is mine, which is Saskatoon, but he always travels somewhere new to some foreign location. That And I always sort of use that to build some conflict and tension. I think that the third I'm going to mention really quickly is just knowing your readers and knowing that you're holding their hand as you're taking them through these books and finding ways to make you feel tense uh, is uh, a bit of a secret. But I'll shut up now and move <laughs> on. Um, well, my, my metaphor that um, I ended up using with my process is kind of apt right now because of the Olympics going on. Um, but I've heard beginning, um, as far as the tension, uh, can um, be likened to um, swimmers pushing off the side of the pool when they're under the water. And so the harder your push the longer you can coast underwater. Um, And so I like to put a really hard push as far as the tension and setting up what's at stake for the character right at the beginning, and then it gives you a little time to sort of slowly go through more of what kind of person they are, and then you're up, and then you've got to start being a little more sort of proactive and splashing and getting other things going on. Um, And this book was actually kind of a, a process for that because being sort of my first real novel that I was working on really hard, um, I rewrote the first three chapters multiple, multiple times. Everybody knows how that goes. Mm. Um, And what I rewrote them mostly for was jumping around where in time um, they were occurring because in the published book, how it happens is that um, one of the two main protagonists is tracking the second one. And she's 
there's something up with her, what's going on, he's tracking her, what's he going to find when he finds her, so that, that's the tension I needed. Um, but in some of the first drafts, he was driving to get the orders to track her, and then he was, uh, another one, he was arguing over the orders to track her, and it was, it was just silly, because it wasn't really sort of setting up that, um, setting up the tension in the stakes right off the bat. And I think that um, the, the long term, as long as it's affecting people, can be really great because I've heard it said that um, one thing you don't want to do with scenes is have reasonable people talking reasonably to each other because then sort of what's happening. But you do get that kind of scene in TV shows a lot, which is the conference table scene where all our heroes gather around the conference table and they exchange information and then they make a plan. And so they're generally reasonable people talking reasonably depending on, you know, if there's somebody who's mouthing off. But the reason that it seems to me that that still does work fairly well on TV shows is because, yes, they're all reasonable people talking reasonably, but you have the big looming threat that's driving the show that's the the monster or the militia or the um, scandal or whatever that they're gathering to plan about. And so that carries the scene because that's providing your tension. I think with tension, the most important thing you have to do is get me to care about your characters before you throw them under the bus. And the best example of that ever was an SGA, SGA episode, The Storm, where you have two characters you've never seen before, and one character says to the other character, bacon is the food that makes other bacon worth eating. And then Kolya bursts through the uh, ring and kills them both. And right away you're thinking, no, not the bacon, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and when you read the, the, the notes of the, th- of the episode, there's actually like two pages of dialogue where they're trying to get these two characters to be liked by the reader before Kolya bursts in and kills them both. And the director looked at it and cut everything except the bacon line. So w- what you want to do is you want to have that explosion where Kolya bursts through the control room and kills these two characters or whatever it is, but you have to get me to care about these characters first. So you need a small explosion that starts the story with small stakes where we get to know the characters because if you just drop a bust on a character, I don't know if that's the main character, I don't know if that's a red shirt, I have no idea who it is. So get me to love the character uh, with a tiny little thing that happens and then throw the bus and go from there because if you start with um, all the interesting things happen 50 years ago and now they're just dealing with the consequences, It's boring. You want all the exciting things to happen on the page as of page one and not 10, 15 years ago. So I know it's hard to think because in your book, the point of view of the character is already set in stone. You can actually manipulate that and move that thing that's supposed to have 10 years ago when the character was but a babe. Well, that gives the bad guy 10 years to prepare for when they finally meet. So you really want to condense that timeline so that all the important stuff happens, page one, chapter one, and then go from there. Uh, Don't set it in a point where you could ever tell the reader, don't worry, nothing bad is ever going to happen. You, you want to tell your characters or your readers, pay attention because not all these people are going to survive and uh, be careful who you like <laughs> and go from there. <clears throat> yeah, I'd have to add on to that. Like, um, I like starting by putting my character in a fairly uncomfortable situation that we can all kind of relate to, but very quickly move into something that ups the stakes from there and puts her into an even worse position. You mentioned stakes, Rhiannon, and and, um, I think that that is a a good good place to to begin with. Let's talk about stakes. Um, People talk about them. How far do do the stakes have to go in in a story? And uh, how do we know they're far enough? How do we go about upping them? So, Anthony, we'll start with you. What do you have to say about stakes? I remember being asked a question by some people a couple years ago were trying to make the series into a a TV series. And one of the script writers asked me the question, what is Russell Quant's Achilles heel? And it it was a great question because I had never thought about it and I couldn't answer it that day. I had to go home and think about it. And the reason she had asked me that is that she believed that finding out what those stakes are is finding out what 
your main character's Achilles heel is and then working around that. And I realized that one of the you know, hallmarks of my series is Russell Kwan's sense of humor. So as a detective, he often finds himself in situations where he's seeing some of the grittiest stuff that life has to offer. How he deals with it, I think how he protects himself is with his sense of humor. So he'll always go into one of those situations and the first things he'll do is he'll look for the funny. It's when I have removed his ability to use his sense of humor where the stakes get very high. And I can only probably think of maybe two or three situations over the course of the whole series where the stakes were so high, things were so serious that there was no way as a writer could I say anything funny. If I, think, if I had had my character say something offhand, I would have lost readers. Uh, one in particular where, is where he was being physically abused. And during the process of that, he lost his ability to see anything funny. He was at his weakest. It was probably one of the most difficult scenes I've ever had to write, but one of the probably one of the best. And it really helped me understand his character more. But you can't do that too often, particularly in the type of series that I write. Um, I think that the, there's sort of two sides to it, because there's the character's goal, and then there's the stakes based on that goal. And um, you gotta you gotta have the goal from the beginning, but then there has to be something bad that happens if they don't achieve the goal. Because you can have a very strong goal of being like um, winning American Idol or something like that. But if your character doesn't achieve that goal, well, okay, so they go home and they're sad. You know, where, where's the stakes in that? There has to be some kind of well. If they don't get to be American Idol, then they've quit their job and they're going to be living in a cardboard box and they like pissed off their best friend because there's a fight and you know they're going to be left with nothing left if they don't win this. You know, which is which is a silly sort of example, but it gives you a sense of them going hand in hand and um, right from the beginning, you want a strong goal and. Um, some kind of stakes to it that you can see immediately, and then that gives you room to escalate later. And I also like to think of it in terms of um, sort of the beginning of the book or in the, in the middle of the book, less than the end, because um, at the end, once you get into the climax, often you have sort of clear stakes because you're getting into maybe physical danger or... Um, really heavy emotional trauma or something like that. So that then it's going to be clear, but you can't wait until you're facing down the Dark Lord for there to be some kind of terrible stakes that are going on. So I think where you have to put the thought in is in the beginning where, okay, they have a very strong goal. They want to kill the Dark Lord. But if they don't, you know, what's going to happen? Oh, no, and then we find out something else is going to happen if we don't do that. And so it, it leads you into a nice sort of trajectory for the story. I think the number one problem I see with the unpublished books that I edit is that the stakes are set up in chapter one and they're the same stakes at chapter 27. And that's one of the worst possible things you could do. When you pick up a published book and you look at the stakes in chapter one, by the time they get to chapter three, those stakes are irrelevant considering what they're dealing with now. And having that constant escalation because your character is always trying and the more he tries the more he fails the more serious the situation is and if you don't have your stakes being at that point where if they don't succeed doing what they're doing the world ends then it's not deep enough if your characters aren't at that point and I hate middles because middles you just have that muddle so I'd rather look at it as the beginning of the beginning the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end and the end of the end. <laughs> and it's 50,000 words because by that 50,000 word mark, if your characters quit, it's game over. If your queer characters um, give up at the 70,000 word mark, it doesn't matter because they're going to lose anyways. You really want to escalate the stakes so that at the beginning it's a very personal goal, very small. And then as the stakes continue, as each scene sets the stakes more and more things become involved. And at that end, I mean, the problem with people who get 70,000 words into their novel and they can't continue it, it's because 
they've just gotten to that point at 70,000 words where they should have been at the beginning of their chapter four, at the end of their chapter three. And raising that stakes at every level, that every scene changes something. And if you don't have that scenes changing the stakes, then you have stagnation. And stagnation is when you put the book away and think, well, one day it might rain. And you don't want to be that book that's just waiting for them to get back to it, especially when you're dealing with a series. I mean, with the first book, you're not sure if the main character is going to survive the end of the book. But if you pick up book two, book five, book seven, chances are he's going to change. He's going to survive and not change. So it's also in the series escalating the the stakes. And if you look at Buffy, by the end of season five, she's facing a god. And... In books, you know, in season six, when she's back to facing just humans again, it's all again all about raising that stake so that in season six or seven, where she faces just a vampire, she's like, "Are you serious?" And yet, this was the whole stakes of the first season three. So it's always, always, always escalating the bad guy, so that no matter how powerful your good guy is, you always have somebody better, stronger, more able, quicker wit character. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I would only disagree with you on one point, and that is I think um, you can set some really incredibly harsh stakes at the very beginning if it's a question of life or death. But it has to escalate. It can't just um, be that. It, yes, it ha- you think there has to be change, absolutely. You, you change. don't want to escalate too linearly no. either. Because no. you see multi-book series where you fight a squid, and then you fight a giant squid, and then you fight a giant squid from the Marianas Trench, and then you're fighting Cthulhu by the end. And then once you fought Cthulhu, where does your series go? That's so I think yes. that you need to not just go linearly on the same track, but in different directions. Absolutely. You know, maybe you're fighting a friend, this time, or maybe this time you can't fight, you have to train somebody else to fight, or you know, sort of thinking in different different directions. Because mm-hmm. linear, linear will always reach a point where it will get silly, and you just can't keep going on that. No, track. Uh, no, no, no. I was sort of thinking that you can start it that way as long as your protagonist gets out of it, but is maybe still pursued, or mm-hmm. if that's if that's yeah. the the type of story that you've got, um, then that will work just fine. Can your characters, can your, particularly your protagonists, can they ever be happy? Can you ever have moments, like, you know, you're thinking about in terms of conflict on every page, or tension on every page, are there any, ever points where you can actually have them content or happy? Have you written anything like that? Anthony. Yeah, I, you know, my character is a a very happy guy, actually. He's a glass half full character. And I think what I said earlier about using humor, that's how I keep him happy. That's his first way of looking at the world. And I think that's one of the reasons that make him a little different. Uh, people enjoy spending time with him because they know there's going to be a lot of feel good moments, even though this is a murder mystery. I think ways of doing that are you know, creating big tension and serious stakes for people other than your main protagonist. With Russell, it tends to be that, you know, his big thing is, you know, typical setup where there's a crime, someone hires him to, you know, do the whole whodunit thing. With a character-based mystery series like I have, I can do some pretty serious things with, again, the subsidiary characters. I can't underscore that enough how important, at least in my series, the subsidiary characters are. Um, Sort of going on something that that Barb said earlier, uh, we know by book eight that Russell Quine is not going to die. So oftentimes when I'm putting him in very serious situations, it's not about life and death. It's about being physically abused or mentally abused or something happened to someone that he loves. Uh, That's what works for him. With the subsidiary characters, every so often, you just got to kill someone. (laughs) And you've got to be careful. It's not something you can repeat too often. But when you do that, if you kill someone that over the course of a series, and again, that's the power of a series, is that your readers get invested in these characters. If you kill someone that you really you know, built up over three, four, five books, and then they're, they've been murdered, that's a pretty powerful thing. Again, you can't do that. And then one more thing, never kill pets. 
I had. So my character school, my character has two dogs, and in in I think the fifth book in the series, there was a scene right towards the end of the book where it's apparent that the dogs have been murdered by the bad guy. And I had people, I can't tell you how many people emailed me with just these most vicious emails saying, as soon as that scene came up, I threw down that book. I'm never going to read another one of your books. How dare you kill Barbara and Brutus, the Labradoodles. And they, did, they didn't actually die, but they didn't finish the book. Never kill pets. <laughs> okay. Brianna. Um, I think that you can have characters be happy with still a sense of forward momentum. Um, and I think that you can lessen the forward men- momentum at the end of a book. Um, because, and for me, I'm writing a series, there still is forward momentum because I want to carry it through into the next book. But it's more that the forward momentum is aimed at a point that's a little farther in the future. They're like, okay, we got to do that, but meanwhile, we can rest for a little bit, and that's how I end the book. Um, and I think within the book, you can be like, well, I got to do that, but I'm going to rest for 10 minutes or whatever. But I think that, I mean, if you think about your daily life, um, there, there can definitely be a sense of, well, I have to go into the office on Monday morning, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to go to the parties tonight just because I know that, yeah, i got to think about, okay, do I have everything done for Monday? No, I'm going to put that aside, and I'm going to have a great time at the party. And I think that you can do that with characters if you keep in mind that they will not have developed amnesia and have for- forgotten what they're worried about, but they're going to decide to enjoy the moment that they're in. And so you don't want to sort of stretch that too long where they're like parting for forever in a long, long scene and they're having a great time, having a great time. You want to bring in the doubts and like, well, tomorrow morning we're going, we're riding out. Um, but people are set up to sort of be like, okay, riding out in the morning, okay, tonight, you know, I'm going to get drunk off my ass and I'm going to enjoy that. And that depending, if you're really scared, that can be sort of a false happiness, but it, it can also be a, a, a true happiness sometimes. So, I think you absolutely need to have high moments in your book because Battlestar Galactica, which I love and is well done, but my God, <laughs> it's just the same note over and over and over again, and it's bad and it's doom, and, and it's, I mean, the stakes are quite high, but I mean, I can only watch... Battlestar Galactica every couple of years and then I have to go out and just be happy for a week or two and then go back to it and I mean we haven't mentioned it yet but the breakout novel if you haven't read it you need almost as many high points in your book as you do low points and the high point could be just as much as showing your characters this is what it would be like if you win or this would be like if you just surrendered because giving up can also be a moment of happiness if it means no longer fighting. And if you don't have those up point and down point, I mean, the entire Star Wars is, he's a Jedi, his uncle dies. But that's okay, he gets away, but then it's in a garbage compactor. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's always like this. The entire, if you took the entire plot of Star Wars, it's up moments and down moments. And I think in modern fiction, we've totally forgot the upbeats. And all we know is just, you know, and I'm, I love putting my characters in a tree, setting it on fire, releasing a bowl of bees, chopping it down. But you have to give them that moment of shining light or nothing, nothing succeeds like that <clears throat> moment of this is what your life might be like if you succeed. And you need them. Without it, you have to put the book down and just walk away because Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Hunger Games. Do you mind if I just add one bit to that, Mm -hmm. Susan? I I really like what Barb just said. And one of the secrets that I've used in my books is that, you know, I think the up and down is is good within a book. You're talking about a real life. We all have ups and downs. The real big downs that I've used, I put them at the end of a book. Because to write about, there was two. One, his best friend died. And I thought, to write a book where he's dealing with that is just going to be a downer for 300 pages. So she died at the end of one book. The next book was a year later. It was okay that he was okay and partying all night somewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing I like to do is if I put in a small moment of joy, that's, you can count on that that's what I'm going to dash the next page two or three after that. 
I'm going to I'm going to destroy that 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 happiness <laughs> one way or the other. So again, more tension. And so you know, if that's that's part of the stakes is building towards getting what you want. You get what you want. You have a brief moment of happiness with that, and then the next day it all goes to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> that's that's how I like to write that. Yeah. If if you have nothing to lose, then by oh. definition there are no stakes, and so you have to give them something to lose, and yeah. then you when you lose track of characters is often when they're like, oh, I have nothing left to lose. And I'm like, well, I don't have anything left to care about you then. You know? Right, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that I ran into a while back was I was playing around with writing from my antagonist's point of view, and I realized I didn't like doing that because I gave away too much. Um, how do you guys deal with, with creating conflict? Do, do you ever portray the inner workings of your antagonist's minds or... Or, you know, just, just uh, yeah, just, let's, let's just go from there. Anthony. Well, I write from the first-person perspective, so okay. we're always, we know everything that Russell knows, which has a, its pros and cons, certainly, because, and, and I think that's why I spoke earlier about having those subsidiary characters and making sure that some are in almost kind of constant conflict with him. That's how I can introduce that because otherwise you're seeing everything from Russell's point of view. He's kind of a likable guy, and he, you know, you're meant to believe everything that he believes. You're meant to see everything that he sees. It's powerful when you've got someone off on the side and saying, you know, you're off your rocker. I mean, that's not at all what happened, or you're being stupid about this, or you're not paying enough attention to your mother, things like that. Um, I'm discovery drafting book four right now. Actually, I did it this morning. Um, and that's the first time I've done a point of view with the, um, actually in the antagonist's head. And the reason why I did it now and I hadn't done it before is because the antagonist in book four um, has a great plan and everything is going to go horribly, horribly wrong, which is still terrible for the heroes because even going, even the train wreck is bad for them. But um, it it works for me in that case because you don't see the antagonist being like, and then I blow up the stadium. <laughs> and then the stadium blows up and you're like, Oh, well, okay. Um, but if you see the antagonist be like, and then I blow up the stadium. <laughs> and then you get the scene from the hero's point of view where they, they find the mysterious package and they're running it away and they're going to dump it in the river and all this sort of interesting, cool stuff that's happening because it's not going according to the antagonist plan. Then you have that interesting sort of, um, con- tension between here's what we saw the plan was going to be and then the plan ain't working out but it's still bad for the heroes so um, but I think that antagonists run into the same thing you get with heroes which is you never want to lay out the plan and then put the plan into effect and you lay it out and it goes into effect exactly as it was laid out because that's twice and the second time is repetitive, and that's silly. So I think that you can run into with antagonists. The trouble is, is that you, you see their motivations, but then you can also see them laying out their plan. And then if it goes into effect exactly as they laid it out, then you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Barb, I love antagonists. I love antagonists' point of views. I love, I love torturing my characters. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, but I think that having An excellent antagonist is the strength of the book. And if you don't have that antagonist that could very easily overwhelm your heroes, it's boring. So having, being in the point of view of the antagonist, you can really show that all of your character's brilliance protagoning (laughs) is coming to none because the antagonist has that already under control. And I, I, I mean, especially when you can reduce your point of view characters to absolute nothing, and they've already traded away everything, and the bad guy is still going to win. Um, Without that point of view, I think that you're actually hurting your story because the antagonist is the strength of the story. Um, Okay, Aaron, go ahead. I just, uh, one of the things that occurs to me, if you have the antagonist point of view, one thing you can also get is you can get the the situational tension where, you know, the the antagonist is thinking, you know, or is receiving news that, you know, the the assassin is in place, hmm. and then, you know, you have a scene with your protagonist, and you know the assassin is there, and you may even know it's, you know, this person that you supposedly trust is going to kill him, 
and then so you have the tension when you're waiting for them to find this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good technique. You know, where you're you're bouncing back and forth between points of view. You know, and you know the two character, the one character may not know what the other one is planning. That certainly works. Um, for me, I kind of like to keep my antagonist um, a little bit at a distance because if I show too much of his inner workings or her inner workings. Um, I lose some of the terror involved with them. I lose some of the mystery involved with them. And I always want my protagonist not quite sure knowing what they're going to do next. So if I do um, portray my protagonist, or my antagonist rather, say in a point of view shift, I might have what he's doing um, reported by a secondary character who is somehow affiliated with him who may have their own motivations as well but who is maybe a little bit more sane than my antagonist and can kind of report what the hell he's doing and how creepy that is. And my protagonist, like I think, um, like you said, Aaron, has no idea what's going on. So I guess it's just a personal mm -hmm. thing. You know, it depends on, on from what point of view you're writing. Like, obviously, you're writing from first person most mm -hmm. of the time, so that's yeah, where you come time. from. Yeah. You know, I tend to write from third person, uh, slip in a little omniscient now and then if I can get away with it. And <laughs> you can certainly have strong antagonists that yeah. you don't happen to be in their point of view. Right. Because yeah. you want their motivations to be really strong in your head. But it depends whether you decide to get in their head and show that to the readers or not. Sometimes you want to, sometimes you don't. Right, yeah. But you, you always want a strong an antagonist who is motivated by something that you know about. Yeah, yeah. no, that's the absolutely true. The book has true. nothing about antagonists, but the workbook has an entire section based on it. Okay, cool. Did you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, with, uh, you know, from, from writing first person, even when I'm doing that all of the time in planning out every book, I have a whole background in who my antagonist is. I know that character very, very well. And then it's just kind of the secret of finding ways to reveal it through my protagonist. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably about time to open Oh, is it questions? time to open it yeah. up for questions? Mm -hmm. Gee, I've got a whole bunch more notes here. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Let's open up the floor to questions. Uh, let's go over here. I'm wondering if you would be willing to attempt to reduce sort of your definition of conflict or tension to its most basic. Because throughout throughout your talking, I'm just thinking about how there there really is something very powerful about things like like shame or or guilt or you know dropping your mother's heirloom ring down a storm drain or you know conflict and tension like that can also be very powerful within within a book. It doesn't necessarily always have to be you know, fighting the big sea monster in, in the end. So would you be able to try and attempt to sort of reduce your idea of what really is conflict to sort of... Sure. And I don't think we negated that because I think what you're talking about are emotional stakes, which uh, can be as engaging as actual physical, you know, life and death kind of scenarios. Anthony, do you want to address that first? Well, I think I, I think I talked about it a little bit at the beginning. To me, it's all about opposition. And it can be emotional. It can be physical. It can be mother against son. It can be, you know, hero against monster. It's always about that, you know, hitting each other somehow. Um, the hero can't get what they want. Um, and uh, a sort of corollary of that is that everybody else around the hero wants things too. And they can't both get what they want at the same time. And so the hero not getting what they want can be sort of environmental, you know. Um, the, the, the situation is the, the road's washed out. He can't get to the other side. That's, that's environmental. Or it could be that um, what he wants is a piece of information. The other person ain't going to give it to him. Um, and I think that people... People do, can think in terms of environmental factors, but then um, what can give you the emotional stakes and, and that sort of thing often is thinking about how every other person around your protagonist wants things and they want conflicting things in all different directions. And so when you're here was trying to get something, then they're going to run smack into what everybody else wants that conflicts with their thing. When you break down into the scene, every book is made up of 30 or 40 or 100 different scenes. Every scene should have a beginning, middle, and end, just like the novel does. 
And within that scene, every scene should have some aspect that changes in some fashion or manner. So when you're going back to editing your book after it's been done, and you go through at the end of each scene, not chapter, because that's too big, but every scene, and if you can't write down what's changed, the scene does nothing and you can cut it. If your characters are talking about things, it's not conflict or tension. If they're arguing about things, it's not conflict and tension. It's your character wants something, it's taken away, and at every scene you have to show it. Because if it's not there, you can just cut it and nothing changes. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty good. Any other questions? Yes? Could you just repeat future questions into the mic? Of course. Okay. <laughs> yes, over here. I find some of the most powerful uh, moments of tension and conflict for me are when a character betrays him or herself. And for me, like the, the biggest example I can think of is in the Lois McMaster Bajold Miles Vorkasigan uh, series, where he all along has been trying to pursue honor and increase the honor of. of it, uh, his family and, and prove that he's an honorable person and eventually he ends up lying to his superior and being caught and, and what you talked about the shame is so powerful because he's betrayed his own ideals uh, comment uh, I guess how do I put that into a summary she's talking <laughs> about self betrayal as, uh, as a way of, of creating tension and inner conflict for the character. Anybody else? Yes, over here. Uh, if one was to write a book about the bad character being the main POV, like say the devil, and you were going to write the whole thing from their point of view, then how would you build the protagonist and antagonist in, into that type of scene? Okay, so um, the question was about telling the story from the antagonist's point of view and uh, putting their motivations in there and how do you deal with the protagonist. I think what you've got there is maybe an anti-hero. And uh, so you will tell it from their point of view and you will probably try and create reader sympathy for your anti-hero and maybe put the reader into a strange position where they're very uncomfortable with that. Your, your uh, antagonist can't get what they want either. I mean, I think that's the, the basic thing, is that maybe they want to rule the world, but the hero is blocking their way, and so then that, that causes tension too. But we didn't just choose the words, ironically, protagonist, the character that acts Forward, and the antagonist is the character that tries to stop them. So if the devil is your protagonist, the antagonist is the person that's trying to stop the devil. So it, the, the words still work, your just motivation has changed. From a mystery perspective, the best example I can think of was a, a series, it was called the Sunday series, it's an older series, I can't quite get the author's name in my head, but his hero was the murderer. And that was the returning character every book. And the way he did it is that he presented his murderer as the protagonist. He was the character you were supposed to sympathize with, even though in every book he ended up killing someone. And it was genius because he somehow got you to feel for him and go like, well, you know, you, you probably should have killed that person. <laughs> yeah. It was brilliant. Justified it was brilliant. Yeah. Dexter. Dexter, yes. And Dexter's another good example, yes. yeah. Over here, uh, you, sir. Do you ever uh, worry about raising the stakes so high that you don't have anywhere else to go? And do we ever worry about raising the stakes so high that there's nowhere else to go? And do we worry about that? Is that what you asked? How do we prevent that? Anthony? I think that that comes down to planning. And I'm, I'm someone who's a, an outline writer. I, I plan the life of my, my hero I do think about that, and particularly when you get farther into a series, you, you know, you're trying to raise the stakes, you're trying to create new stakes, getting to a position where you're getting to that ultimate, you're either deciding that this series is coming to an end, because to get to that, to, to get to that ultimate where it's too far, you know, one of two things has to happen. Either he has to then find some way to overcome it, and it wasn't so ultimate after all, or you're done. You kind of have to decide. And some of the endings of some of the best series have been exactly what you've talked about, where there, were, there was nowhere else to go. And those are, to me, anyways, those are very satisfying endings 
to a series. You know, I'm going to have to stop it there. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Rhiannon. Thank you, Barb. Uh, great panel. Thank you all for coming. We could go on for another hour, I think, but we have to get out of here. So thanks. I have bookmarks for anybody.